the stage is set for a journey of ambition and determination on the big spark. Let's go! 24 startups from all over Southeast Asia were put to the test in round one, the quick pitch. All the best. It's a yes from all three of us. Congratulations. 15 startups have now risen above the rest to enter the second stage, the in depth pitch. Voila! The stage is yours. Startups will have their business plans and financials come under heavy scrutiny at this stage of the competition. On what basis do you decide how much money and who to give money? Can we go to the numbers? I don't have any number slides. And only four to eight will proceed to the finale. We've got our work cut out for us. To get that share of seat funding worth up to $1 million, startups will have to impress our eight venture capitalists. Sebastian Togala, Visa Kanat, UC Sadovara, Anuch Golecha, Vanessa Ho, Murli Ravi, John Sharp, and Neeraj Tiagi. Optionally, funds can be paid in USDC, a US dollar equivalent issued by Circle, which arrives in wallets within seconds. Kicking off the in-depth pitch today are Altedverse, Cable, Farlife Plus, Ether IoT, and Farmio. Right here on The Big Spark. I'm feeling a little bit more nervous today because it's a longer pitch and you know we're anticipating for unknown questions to come from the judges. We are a job matching platform that helps employers to match with unique student talent the moment that they post up a job. All they need to do is post their profile, swipe, match and chat. I do feel that it would put minority races at a much higher chance of bias. Uh, so for me, it's a definite no. I can see my team using it. It's a yes for me. It's a yes for me. Thank you. In the quick pitch round, we have taken judges' concerns and feedback seriously. Not sure how much you want to use Tinder as a reference okay. in your pitch. Because and when... so this time around, in the in-depth pitch, I'm going to address that by highlighting the existing features that we have on safety issues. We added one more layer of safety feature as well, which I'll be sharing with the judges later. Camelia! Hello, Diana! <laughs> Yes. Can you do it? I can do it. Yes. Yes. I'm okay. confident. Hi. By addressing the scalability of the product and the business profit, I'm quite sure that I'll be able to nail the in that pitch to bring us to the next round. We have our two distinguished judges with us today. On the far left, we have Mr. Mustafa Kapasi. He's from M1. I'm hoping to see a business idea that at its core has societal good and a business case that is world-leading. And we have Mr. Eric Lian, who's from UOB. We pride ourselves to be one bank for ASEAN with the purpose of building the future of ASEAN by connecting businesses within ASEAN and Greater China. We will, at some point, be interrupting your pitch. Sure. So, no surprise, OK? You've got 10 minutes for your presentation today. We're very excited to see what improvements you've made to your pitch since Thank we you. last chatted. <laughs> yes, I'll try to address that. Hello, judges. My name is Camelia. I'm the founder of Cable. From where I come from, Malaysia, Cable means connection. We help employers find the best talent in just three steps. You swipe, match and chat, and there you go. Our innovation lies in delivering uh, talent on demand. Traction since October 2021, where we first launched, we have successfully made 8,000 over matches between employers and students all graduate and successfully facilitated 1,000 plus hirings in the past 12 months or so. Most of my employees here are basically Gen Z's fresh from school, so they totally understand the pain when it comes to searching for jobs. Camilia, are you still going to be using 
photos? We are. That's a good question. <laughs> I thought I wanted to actually address Roshni's concern over there. If you see on the far left, we have changed that to an avatar. To good Daniel. job in listening to feedback. <laughs> yes. So that's to prevent any biasness, any sexual harassment and whatnot. When you reveal the face, even the employer, the, the recruiter, Yes. Face will also be reviewed. Exactly. Mm. So it's both sides. So this is to make it fair and equal, right? And up to even stage three, when there is a chat, there's still no exchange of information. We don't allow any parties, whether it's employers or the students, to search for their talents. So everybody has an equal opportunity to shine in front of the employers based on their skill sets. And we use our property scoring system to score them to get them the best fit uh, jobs. As an employer, you can rely on Cable's unique proposition highlighting each candidate's USP in delivering why is this candidate most suitable for you. We have seen a matching rate of 40%, three out of seven recommendations, as compared to a traditional platform, which is five out of 250 resumes in a month. How do you monetize on this? Do you want to skip to your slide that okay, talks about sure. it? Okay, so we charge employers a $10 per match. As of now, what employers are paying on a regular job portal is about 150 uh, USD per job post, and that's without any guaranteed matching. So just by charging them on the match itself to unlock the chat, just a $10, our forecasted revenue per annum based on the 30% market share will be about 70 million uh, USD. Are you going to be getting the whole 2 million entry-level jobs? Southeast Asia alone is about 6 million and we want to command a 30% market share, right? And that gives us about like 2 million entry-level jobs. 30% so how... in how long? Sorry? In how long? In how long? Okay, mm. that's a very good question. So if the next 24 months we are projecting to acquire 50,000 jobs on cable, so 7 million could be maybe 5 years? Uh, maybe we can move to your scaling business slide and look at your financials. Scaling business slides. This one? Yeah. Okay. By 2026, I think we'll be ready to actually market Southeast Asia as a talent pool to reach globally. Why do you only have a $15,000 increase of revenue from 23 to 24? Um, Pricing-wise, is actually kind of like... Uh, uh, still... It is, okay, so the $10 is basically a global average and we are still fixing on like what would be a comfortable uh, level of charging. It could be more, it could be less. I think it should be more. I think so too. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll tell you why, yeah. because today yeah. recruiters are paying way more. How many employers and employees would you require to make this business viable for you? How many, in, in total, in Numbers, life? Numbers, yes. Okay. That's a really good question. I mean, we we calculated... So 2 million will require how many employers okay, to so sign up on your platform? Right. So assuming that one employer uh, would roughly post up about three to five jobs, so on a yearly basis, it will be just the 2 million divided by, yeah, five or so. So what are your key assumptions that you can... Okay. You know, five times, six times your revenue growth? Yes, so we're building a magnet in-house by automating and streamlining the CRM and the sales part of it by not doing a B2B reach out. One of your key drivers is also to do cross-border in terms of uh, restriction around employment. It's not that easy said and done that you can hire from Malaysia or from Vietnam to, to fill up jobs here. The solution that we are actually working on is basically a partnering with payroll companies that can help to put them on remote, uh, as a remote workforce. It's not the easiest, mm. but if you can solve it, yes. you will find opportunities Exactly, in that's where the interesting part is. Yeah, yeah. all right. Thanks, Camilia. Yeah. We'll get back to you. Thank you so much. I was wishing that the questions were much easier. Unfortunately, it wasn't. She wasn't very clear exactly how to make that $10.5 million in 2026. I don't see a moat. Reaching that scale of consumers requires substantial investments. I think that she has a VC investable business. If she can build the ecosystem, then the ecosystem itself will be a moat. 
I think I gave my best shot and covered most, or in fact, the ones that I planned, but they were asking further and beyond. That was the tough part. The scale, technology and the speed, all three to work for her, is a big challenge. Hi. Hey, Camilo. Hi, Dr. Pauline. How did it go? I don't know. I hope for the best. The questions were pretty detailed, uh, quite challenging as well. Now you can relax. <laughs> A little, I was trying to calm down still. Yeah, yeah. All the best, Prof Chan. Thank All you, the best, thank Dr. You. Thank you. Good thank luck, you. Good luck. Entrepreneurship is not easy. It's a very challenging task with a lot of ups and downs, with a lot of intersections. So you need a trusted team behind you who advise you when you get lost, who pick you up when you're down, but who also keep you honest when things are going well. I always think you should reward instead of incentivize. And he said, the difference is that if someone does a good job and you reward that person, that right person will stay. But if you use it as an incentive, then you might have the wrong person staying for the wrong reasons. The best piece of advice that I received was to be humble and have the openness to learn. My sister used to say to me, don't listen to nosy parkers. And I think what she meant by that is, people should mind their own business and you can follow your own path. I like having you around and it will really boost my confidence. Lah. You are still not using your diaphragm. <laughs> I will try to, I will remember. We are very stressed, <laughs> but uh, we are well prepared. Producing we have done quite a lot of homework. Yeah. We are going to do our best for this pitch. At Five Plus, we have developed and patented breakthrough uh, medicated oral films to eliminate the pains of medicine taking. I don't see why you need to just focus on palliative. This is something that you could be with kids as well, right? For me, it will be a yes. Thank you. For me, it's a yes as well. For the quick pitch round, we just zoom in on the elderly and the dying. But we were given the advice by Waiman to broaden the patient pool. We'll definitely be able to share more information about that later. During the presentation, I, I lost the words. When you are doing a presentation, let your body stand nice and tall, shoulders back. Show them you're confident. The challenge today will be to stay focused and maintain a high level of energy to engage the judges. This time round, we're going to start with the hook and the judges will be kept on their toes. How are you yes. feeling, Polly? Good, good. Yeah. I'm more confident with Prof Chan around, okay. pitching alongside with me. You feel better? This is your second pitch on the show. Yes. Okay, good luck. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Diana. Have you had the experience of giving children their medications? <laughs> I have. And it always ends up with three S's. Screaming, spilling and spitting. <laughs> so, we present our medicated oral film that is easy to take and quick to give. It is edible, thin, light and flexible. I think we have some samples there. And how it works, very easy. Open the mouth, just paste the phlegm inside the mouth on the cheek and the meds will be released from the phlegm, absorbed into the blood and you experience relief. Who are those who will need such medicated oral phlegms? People who can't swallow, those who are suffering from blocked veins or their gut doesn't function properly. We also have patients who are allergic to certain ingredients in the medicine or those who want to avoid other ingredients and some have fluid restriction. It minimizes cost, stress and time. The medication rounds are less tedious and they'll be more efficient. And then because the flumps are so thin, you have less to store and it's easier to transport. Medicated oral phlegm will reduce medical waste because you don't need to dispose of the used stranger's needles or the gadgets. The hospitals will save cost. Our business model involves supplying premix powders of our films to some local hospitals. Regulatory approval is not required. Our business model also involves the manufacturing and sales of finished films. For this, regulatory approval is required. And because of the way that we manufacture our film, 
accurate doses are assured. We have uh, developed a unique formulation. We can tune the concoction to either release the medicine in 10 seconds or it can be as slow as 30 minutes. We believe that our premixed powder will always be needed by the hospital because uh, very often patients need to tweak the medicine. Mm. Mm. So the fl finished film will only be a fixed formula, may contain the ingredients that certain patients do not want. This looks like an absolutely a commonsensical product. Yes. Why isn't it been used so far? The edible polymers that we are using are uh, developed later part in maybe the late 70s. Um, the pharma industries, they have already invested a lot of money into buying machineries, equipment to manufacture tablets, capsules. In order to adapt to manufacturing um, medicated oral films, it takes time for them to change. So what you're saying is that the incumbents are too vested themselves and it takes a lot to actually disrupt themselves. Yeah, yes. Mm. We want to challenge that. <laughs> okay. So this is our go-to market strategy. We first conduct needs assessment by reaching out to local hospitals and then we, we supply the pre-mixed powders to the hospitals. We are also looking at forming partnerships with pharma companies to jointly file for regulatory approval for our finished films and to leverage on their manufacturing capacities as well as distribution network for the sales of our finished films. What is your thinking around the revenue generating from the second part? The idea that we have is um, to actually co-fund um, the regulatory filing for our film and also to take a cut uh, of the revenue from the sales of film. What, what are you patenting? Yeah, it's quite wide. We covered the formulation, the product formulation, as well as the process and the system to manufacture the product. And there is no competing patent over your, which you're worried about? Uh, we have done our research into that. Okay. We are scaling up productions in order to reach more patients in the $370 billion global market for alternative drug delivery systems. To do so, we are raising half a million dollars for the next two years. Our burn rate is $11,000 per month. We foresee that we will be able to break even within four years and generate $4.5 million in revenue after five years. You are able to achieve just $11,300 of burn per month. Is that accurate or is it because you're not paying yourself? Prof Chan is not paying herself. I'm <laughs> paying myself only three k a month. Okay. Can you yeah. survive on that? <laughs> that to me is a very real challenge for entrepreneur. Look at your own numbers. Is it realistic to say that you live on $3,000 a month for the next X number of years? Yeah. What you don't want is for an investor to invest and then you substantially just increase your pay to the point that your investor will feel like, hey, you know, am I getting on the wrong road? To qualify that, I didn't take a salary for the first three years. So it is, it is normal. Because she <laughs> a can lot, afford it. <laughs> a lot of entrepreneurs do it if you believe enough in your idea. You have got a very good value proposition, just that you need a more commercial person to join you. It's really for you to go and find ways to get it done, monetize it, and hopefully we can get you know, see this product sooner than later. This is something that we, we both are very, very passionate yeah. about. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan and Professor Chan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. The questions are quite manageable, quite expected. Okay. Yeah, we have prepared for them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it will really revolutionise the way we take medicine, you know. Why haven't the pharma companies adapted this if it is so good? Mm. Uh, well, we could say that about the taxi companies. Big players just don't like to disrupt themselves. Yeah. So if that's the case, I think this has got potential. Yeah. And as an end consumer, I would pay whatever price it is not to hear my baby screaming yeah. every time I inject them. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that with investment coming in, we'll be able to pay ourselves more decent pay so that we can sustain our business. Just like what Roshi said, for three years, she didn't give herself any pay. I'm willing to go that distance. We really hope to get this $1 million funding so that we can bring our product forward for the benefit of many, many patients.
now we have a scalable business model story. So I'm very confident that we'll be able to convince them. We will just take it like a conversation. With yeah, them. agree, agree. Them. A quick pitch round. The key feedback from the judges is that we should tell a story that our business is scalable. Altaverse is making virtual world a practical tool for businesses to use, to train, to plan, to market and to socialise. There is that one big issue with the revenue model. Can you not be licensing that to other service providers rather than building a service of it yourself? Perhaps something to consider. Elvin and Jean, you guys are going to be shortlisted for deliberation. You're yes. on to the next round. So this time with the in-depth pitch, we will gather all of the inputs that we've gotten and highlight why the business is scalable. You already have Explain the mechanics, how we're going to operate and how we're going to go to market. So what is one thing that you learned from the masterclass that you will apply today? I think it's helped us to sharpen our message to the um, you know, investors and judges. We do feel a bit worried that we're not as prepared as we want to. All the best. This way, please. Thank you. What we are building is something new. For me, the dream is to see that our product impact the world. We just hope that we can articulate the vision well enough for the judges to really understand what we're doing. Hello again. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. Doing good. <laughs> we're ready to present a version 2 of Authorverse. Right. We very much would love for you to tell us what you've got today. Thank you. Right. Please go ahead. Thank you. So Authorverse is a company that helps clients convert the physical world into immersive, accurate 3D walls. A lot of retail malls are still having troubles with shoppers' traffic. There's urgency to see radical changes in the way people shop. We have our roots in geospatial technology. We're a spin-off from a family business. And we have managed to marry the geospatial technology with gaming technology, and we are applying it into uh, government sectors and now into private sectors. We've identified retail malls and retail stores as a vertical that we will enter. So we are enabling a new way of shopping. Our business caters to one, the B2B, which is the malls, to make it entertaining, lifelike and fun. Imagine if I want to buy something for a dear friend, maybe in Japan or something, and then I send them a link and they enter this particular world where you can go in with your friends, you buy a product inside. How are we going to make money? Obviously through scanning, you can really scan, and deliver the quality in a cost-efficient manner to our clients. Second part is subscription. Finally, commissions. So as they transact in our world, in our authorverse world, we will get a cut of the commission. What is the main difference from what you're doing today that the mall will want to subscribe? Websites can be very flat and static, but this is a new way of shopping. It's about socialising, bringing 3D. your friends on board. Mm -hmm. it's, it's 3D space. You can take a look at uh, you know, the physical products. For example, my wife bought this in Japan. And she didn't know that this is, the sleeves is a little <laughs> too long, right? But imagine I could create an avatar where I can put in my own dimensions. The AI may even recognise my dimensions and pick the appropriate type of fabric clothes for myself. So there will be real-world utilities and it's meant again to convenience the end user. Who pays for the commission? Is the store going to pay for the commission or the mall is going to pay for the commission? I just want to know where are your commercialization? Where is your revenue stream? It will be tied to the products. Um, as a platform, we will take a small percentage, like you know any other app store. We'll start with the retail malls. They have a huge database of customers. The individual retail stores that's housed in the retail mall also have their own separate database. I think we can capture a good 1%, 2% conversion from there. There are three sales journeys that every one of us goes through in the retail sector. The first journey is direct online. The second purchase journey is through a physical direct. And the third is a hybrid of online and offline, what they call digital. A retail sale in, in 2026, two-thirds of the retail sale will be through a digital mode. So our precise platform here will fit that sort of sales journey. You have improved from a previous version, so I think that's a very good start for me. What is that minimum version of what you need to get to before you can start charging commission? At the first dollar of transaction in the virtual world, we'll make commission you have to be very clear on who you are trying to get the commission from. If you are trying to get a commission from the mall, I think it's one party to work with. Because I can imagine you have got different brands. Are you going to talk to 300 different brands? 
it's going to be very, very tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something to think about as well as your lifetime value of a customer, as well as what's the cost of acquiring a customer. Is it profitable? All these things should come into your own equation as you start to build your minimum viable product. Yes, the unit economics is something that we're working on. We are asking for $1 million to turn this vision into a reality. The usage of funds will be generally into some form of AI to help with um, accelerating the physical world into the digital world, as well as with helping up you know, uh, store setups. The other part would be on the platform development and the world building. You want to get customers back into the physical space. Yes, yes. But you're giving guys all the comfort of not coming back to the retail. <laughs> So, does that contradict your statement? There will be some cannibalization, but we're very careful because we're serving the retail malls, the retail operators. There are, you know, different ways of gamifying and incentivizing the consumer to go visit the real store. This technology that you have, is it patented? Similar to most gaming technologies, they're not patented. What's important is how we build user-centric engagements within here. It's an area where it's very different from what's already existing out there. Because you have a gap out there, you have the architects and you have the gamers. Yep. And we are fulfilling a sweet spot to develop that process. Our win rate so far in proposals is 75%. When do you plan to become positive, a bit positive? We're very keen to capture the commission revenue. I think by 2025, we're targeting for that particular product stream, we're targeting five to 10 mil of a gross margin of 90%. Gross margin, 9%. 90%. On a top line of five to 10 million. For 10 million, yes. Let's estimate based on the retail sales and how much we can capture that. Why don't you have a slide on your financials projections? That's, that's a great point. Uh, we have prepared it. We do know the top line that we're going to capture. We just haven't put it all together in the financial model yet. So what happens if you don't get one million in funding? How does that affect? I think it will be a combination of bootstrap with and then plus existing sales. We we'll definitely want to meet with the right investor that perhaps are already in the space, but they're just lacking that technology or that particular use case. Okay, Gene. Okay, Alvin. Wishing you the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alvin, Gene, big smiles. Wow. Yeah. Is, what, what was that? You feel very triumphant or victorious? For me, I'm happy with small wins. I noticed some. <laughs> Knots around the table, mm -hmm. and I noticed the eyes were sparkling. So I think what we presented today, version mm -hmm. two, was something that was inspiring. Fantastic. I wish you the very best. I hope that you'll be one of the four to eight who will make it to the last stage. Thank you. Thank you. I think the judges were left with the impression that we are a team that is coachable, flexible, and agile. Of how quickly we've changed from version one to version two. I think we nailed it. But man. we didn't have enough time to run the financial models to determine the unit economics. Yeah. yeah, we could have done a little bit better. I'm not quite convinced mm. that this is going to be the key driver mm. or going to be the game changer. Retail mall would not be the one I would pick up as the first use case to launch my business. I was expecting to see a robust financial model and even looking at different types of use cases. They are trying to pivot, but they are still trying to do some effect finding. Mm. Well, I hope the next startup is significantly better. <laughs> <laughs>
Always ready. <laughs> yes, always ready. So Greg and I uh, are, we're building Ether IoT. So essentially we're trying to build the stripe of indoor real-time tracking. It consists of two main things. Number one is location tracking. So imagine large indoor facilities like airports, shopping malls, hospitals, using IoT sensors to instantly know the location of their assets and people. And number two is condition monitoring. So these same large enterprises using IoT sensors to determine temperature, humidity, air quality, et cetera. Indoor real-time tracking is a market that's growing exponentially, 25% year on year. So from a six billion annual consumer spending today to over 30 billion by 2030. Again, just by capturing 0.3% of the market or three out of every $1,000 spent will become a billion dollar company. The problem with the industry is that there's thousands of different IoT sensors, and each of these sensors have their own different communication methods and data protocol. And so this makes it a huge pain for system integrators, or SIs, to retrieve, interpret the data from these smart, uh, from these smart devices, and actually use this data for any meaningful business applications. And what's worse is that they have to repeat this hair pulling process for every additional IoT sensor that they want to use. So our solution is what we call the Ether Management Platform. Essentially, let us handle the manual hair pulling process of interpreting, taking the data from these smart devices and normalizing into a standard format that any software can easily ingest. At the core, we are unequivocally a product company. Once we integrate these IoT sensors onto our platform, we bundle it with our Ether Management Platform and sell it to the SIs. And the SIs will pay us a one-time fixed upfront fee for the hardware. We just bundle a 20% margin on top, and they will pay us reoccurring fees on our Ether management platform. So to date, we've been able to 12x our revenue between year one and two. In year one and two, the bulk of the revenue is going to be hardware revenue because of our business model. But once the SI buys the hardware from us, they're paying reoccurring fees for, for years. So in the long term, we expect over 75% of our revenue to be coming from reoccurring on our SaaS platform, while 25% or less so coming from hardware. So what is this hardware revenue? Is it the IoT devices that you're supplying, or is it the platform cost that you're charging your customers? The IoT devices that you see, you know, this is where the initial phase when we sell, this is where the bulk of the revenue comes in. But, you know, on our platform, Understood. there is a subscription Understood model. That. So if the IoT devices are not yours, they are third-party devices. Would you still integrate those uh, data from those devices or no? Yes. Eventually, we will be integrating with all kinds of devices. We will be building bridges, gateways to other systems. At the end of the day, what we have is a marketplace of all kinds of devices that the system integrates will be able to use, plug and play, and these are interchangeable, interoperable. In the long run, it could be that we focus entirely on the platform and there will be other manufacturers and vendors that use our platform because it inter in uh, interoperates you know, through software. And what margins do you get on the hardware? Uh, the hardware is typically around 15-20% margin. 15-20%? 15-20% margin. But the SaaS platform, you know, gives us 80-90%. I'm actually quite interested in how you intend to monetize those data. Once we collect enough data, there are ways that we can, you know, monetize this data. So this is our projected revenue for the next three years. All the hardware we have is third party. We go out there, we find the right vendors based on the solutions that's needed. We integrate the data and we say, here at SI, here's the hardware and here's our platform. Pay us the upfront fee for the hardware and recurring fee on the, on, the, on the platform. Gregory, what will you use the funding for? Uh, yes, so... Uh, so we're going to use the proceeds. Um, yeah, here it is. So we're, we're looking for SGD 497,000 in exchange for 10% of either IoT. And we're going to use it mainly for two critical hires in 2024, one on the inch side and one on the BD side. So the first two years, we've been focused very much on building the product, which took some time because of the complexity. And then we started you know, investing in building relationship with system integrated partners. We onboard them, we, we, we train them, and we help them understand how to sell the solution. We got around 20 over system integrators 
around the world, from South America, North America, Europe, you know, uh, Middle East, Africa. We, are, we have been a global business, and now these SIs are now starting to understand and they're starting to bring so Greg, on board. Who is your customer? Yeah. Is it the end customer or is no, it the SI? No, it's the system that... integrators. They are the system integrators. Why would an SI select you guys and not another similar customer? Ours is one of, you know, uh, a solution where we have integrated across multiple uh, technology. We focus on the indoor. Right now, 99% of IoT companies in the indoor real-time tracking space is focused on building first-party hardware. And that runs into the exact same problems that they've always had, which is the integration nightmare. For us, we're an integration platform that offers them a whole wide, wide range of different hardware. So that aspect is very attractive to them. So instead okay, of pulling... Okay, Gregory, uh, Vincent, I think we've had a deep understanding of your business. We need some time to discuss as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. They asked a lot of deep dive questions. I think overall we did a good job. Let me just remind you one more time, four to eight of you will make it to the final big pitch. I wish you all the best. Thank, yeah, you, thank, very, you. thank you very much. There are a lot of deeper questions that we had to answer, but I think we did our best to address those concerns and comments from the judges. I'm not sure exactly what are the competitive advantage or why would people choose them. At this stage, I see them as a ETL platform, which is extraction, transformation, and loading data. Mm. That's what they do. That's not too much value sitting over mm. there. There's no moat. There's no moat. Mm. Unless they can give insights to those extracted data. That doesn't seem to be their forte. Mm. So there's still work to be done. Mm. I think entrepreneurs are born and not made. Someone who's super laser focused on customers, knows what they want to do with their company, but at the same time, who's adaptable and flexible enough to change course when the situation demands it. True entrepreneurs are founders that can scale a business in a sustainable way, create long lasting companies in a profitable way. This is what I think makes an entrepreneur. A visionary, a salesman, a team leader, and an operator. One is uh, the, the passion to the vision, uh, second is a great people person, and third is a great execution. Someone who both has a vision as well as the capability to execute. Someone who builds with purpose, who is able to attract the right kind of people to back this purpose, and who wants to build something that long outlasts him or her. from the feedback of the judges in the first pitch. They mentioned that we should be much more in-depth in each problem statement. We are Farmio, building a sustainable AI food supply chain in Asia. We integrate our AI solution into WhatsApp. You mentioned three problem statements. Yes. It feels like you're trying to tackle a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a no for me. A greater clarity and direction on your engineering effort will get you there a lot earlier. I think they deserve a chance. Uh, it will be a yes uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. We just need to highlight whatever we missed out. The I biggest think. challenge yeah. is making sure that they will be able to empathize uh, with the problem statement that we come with. I want us to really enjoy every moment on the stage. We have tried our best. I hope that they will feel our spirit and feel what we are trying to solve in the food industry. As long as we put all our hearts in, we believe that we have the ability to win it and make it to the finale. Paco, how are you stepping up your game? We are very, very excited to share about the ideas to the judges. I like that. You're focused on sharing your idea, which is exactly what this is about. All the best. Thank you. This way, please. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Hi, judges. We are Farmio. My name is Paco, Adrian, and Leo. And we are here to redefine the Asia food supply chain with AI. So I personally had an experience in China last year. Unfortunately, I encountered into the COVID. There were some times that I have experience of food shortage. The same experience happened to Andrew as well. That is the reason why we want to look in the food supply chain when I came to Singapore. We went to Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam, Philippines, and Taiwan. We've spent four months talking to distributors, suppliers, and restaurants. And we see that the food supply chain in Asia 
is very, very traditional, including cities like Hong Kong and Singapore. In Farmio, we are solving two problems in daily workflow and financing. We have one customer, they have over 3,000 restaurant partners, 2,800 WhatsApp groups, <laughs> and they're hiring 100 customer service just to handle all the CS. As a result, they're spending over 40,000 Singapore dollars every month just for the customer service. Fret not, judges. Farmio is here with an answer. Without trying to change too much in the way orders is being placed today, as well as other operations, we are leveraging on a technology that our suppliers are very familiar with. In our case, it's called WhatsApp. True. AI assistance, as well as automation. A seamless integration with WhatsApp to simplify the ordering processes and minimize any possible errors. And at the same time, we are creating electronic invoices. Besides that, we also have created the ability to introduce notifications for payment chasing purposes, as well as pricing updates for our suppliers. A lot of time, our suppliers do miss out on the complaints, on the order revision, because it's manual. We have created this notification purposes that directly targets their customer service staff, so they can attend to them diligently and at, uh, at the time that is required. The biggest benefit that suppliers are getting is the reduction in the cost they have to you know, fork out when it comes to hiring customer service, and in turn... How's the conversations with the uh, guys who have 3,000 restaurants? Have they come on board on your platform since you are able to help them save 80% of customer yes. service cost? They are already on board on our platform today, but uh, they have not like fully reduced their customer service because we are still like testing with them, and then uh, we still need to get more data from, um, you know, their ordering as well to improve the system. What is your current error rate today? Around 20%, especially for unstructured data. Uh, but somehow we have created some sort of a template which coincides with the way they have been conversing with the businesses that they partner with. Okay. Suppliers usually, if they are in this business long enough, they have their own CRM system. Yes. So how do you intend to replace them? We are not going to replace their CRM. I and mean, we are not going to replace their system. We see that people in food supply chain, or especially food industry, they don't want to change. Our system actually are able to integrate with you know, some of their biggest system, like CRM system, so that they're not changing anything on their end. And they can maintain WhatsApp ordering for people to communicate on WhatsApp, and everything will go through um, their system directly and automatically. Can we uh, move to your financial slides? There are other problems that we want to go through first? We don't have much time okay. for that. Can we okay. move to financials? That is our financial models. We have two charging models. The first one is we charge based on the connection point. For example, if you have 10 FMB partners, on each partner we charge you a certain amount of money. The second thing is that we are doing supply chain financing. Buy now, pay later solution for B2B. On that part, we will need the support from financial partner, including banks. On that part, we can provide... Sorry, can I just check? Who are you financing? Are you financing the restaurant or are you financing the suppliers? We are financing the supplier. B2B buy now, pay later is a bit new, especially in the food supply chain. In the food supply chain, typically people offer payment term from three days to 30 days. So now we can provide all the supplier, they can receive the money in three days. On the other hand, we are serving the FMB to provide a standard payment term. On what days. basis do you decide how much money and how, mm. who to give money? So in this case, we are actually partnering with a financing partner they will do some sort of a KYC and due diligence. Yes. And from there, they will come up with a, a figure. Okay, financial projections? The projection is that, like, based on our current contract, uh, we expect we have, like, 10x growth in upcoming six months. And then we will be able, in less than, like, one year, we are able to hit more than six digits of revenue. What would be useful when you build that model? It actually helps you to really think through the revenue drivers, the cost drivers, so and so forth. Yeah, end of the day, VCs or a bank or whatnot, they always look for these things. So something for you to consider. The financing model, I think it's a little bit more difficult. Unless you can offer something what the bank or the financial institution cannot do. 
I think we're going to need to discuss it. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Not very convinced with their financing model. The CRM system in most supplier, major supplier, would be able to do that really. Correct. I've seen the retail mm. CRM systems. Mm. It's pretty advanced. Yes. One question that did catch me off guard a little was the financial projection. I wish we have included a slide to speak a bit more on the estimated revenue and estimated projections in this coming year. We had a lot of things in our slides that we wanted to present. It but unfortunately, just, time didn't know, permit. So too many slides. Too many slides. I mean, if it's a VC, I don't, <laughs> I don't think the VC would have any time to go through everything. We hope to redefine the food supply chain. Getting a share of this one million funding for sure is important for Farm Yo. The first batch of five startups stood before the judges today and had their business plans and financials thoroughly examined. Who among them will secure a spot in the final big pitch for a share of that $1 million funding? All will be decided at the end of Stage 2. I'm Diana Sir, signing off from The Big Spark. On the next episode of The Big Spark, six startups are geared up and ready to impress the judges. I want to franchise this to the world. Which of them will emerge as the finalists to pitch for a share of the funding of up to one million dollars? Start. Are you demoing the app at all? Do you have a financial slide? How much revenue have you made so far? Two hundred thirty-five dollars. 